first propose here some elaborations of Mustafa Emirbayer's and Anne Misha's conceptualization of human agency, which has become a standard reference for migration scholars inspired by the uh, structuration and uh, morphogenesis theories. I then <coughs> offer some comments on the representations of human actors uh, in recent famous papers and other publications of the authors uh, dealing with migration processes. I <clears throat> illustrate these suggestions with empirical examples drawn from studies of past and present international migrations, and on this basis I signal some issues requiring further theoretical attention. <clears throat> My propositions rest on three premises. <coughs> First, I view the purpose of sociological analysis as the study of the way society shapes uh, individuals and reciprocally individuals shape society. The approach captured in the revised structuration model which has informed my research. Uh, this uh, theoretical perspective, by the way, is apropos our discussion last night, uh, holds human actors to be the integral sine qua non element of any attempt to comprehensively account for societal phenomena. So first was this structuration approach. Second and third, as a historical sociologist, I conceptualize both human actors and the surrounding societal environment as processes of continuous, mutually contingent becoming, rather than as entities fixed in time. And they forms and contents as always changeable and never fully determined. And uh, th third, my third premise, I recognize the ever potential causal impact on the examined phenomena of the temporal dimension of the events, specifically the pace, slower or quicker, rhythm, regular or irregular, sequence or trajectory, that is the order in which the events happen, and duration, uh, longer or shorter. Founded on these uh, premises, my a conceptualization of the situation of human actors in the surrounding society presents them neither as over-socialized creatures who reproduce puppet-like the sociocultural systems around them, uh, nor as under-socialized adventurers who negotiate the social surroundings in a voluntaristic fashion. I do not subscribe either to the representation of human actors as rendered in the common play on Marx's famous dictum that people make their own history, but under conditions not of their making. Uh, <clears throat> rather, <clears throat> rather, while recognizing that human agency is exercised within the existing structural conditions rooted in past societal arrangements, I acknowledge human actors' mm, capability to exert depending on time and place specific circumstances, a greater or lesser degree of control over the situations they find themselves in, which can lead toward the transformation over time of these conditions. <coughs> <coughs> I see I have competition here. <coughs> <laughs> I also find uh, useful uh, Colin Campbell's uh, distinction of two aspects of personal agency, uh, namely the power of agency or an actor's ability to initiate and maintain a program of action, and varying degrees of the agentic power as actor's ability to act independently of the constraining power of societal structures. This uh, causal facility of human actors, however, is not simply the product of the agentic volition, uh, but the dialectics of the, if you want, power to and power over in those actors' engagements with the surrounding societal structures. Now, as Emir Bayer and Misha define it, uh, human agency denotes, I quote, uh, everyday engagement by individuals of different structural environments, which through the interplay of habit, imagination, and judgment, both reproduces and transforms those structures in interactive response to the problems posed by changing situations, unquote. The authors represent human agency as comprising three analytically distinguishable components, uh, which uh, they call iter the iterative, practical evaluative, and projective dimensions. 
It is regarding the second practical evaluative component of human agency that I would like to suggest a refinement. Although, as Emir Bayer and Misha recognize, uh, human agency entails the capacity of actors to make practical and normative <coughs> judgments among alternative trajectories of actions, of action, pardon me, it is probably because of the emphasis in the name practical evaluative that the meaning of this dimension of human agency has come to denote the instrumental means to ends calculative approach. I would like therefore to propose the replacement of the term practical evaluative with a more general evaluative accompanied by a distinction uh, between in Weber's terms for example instrumental and value rational assessments. Certainly not all, but a significant number of political refugees fleeing oppressive regimes worldwide leave their countries often against all practical calculations with no projective vision of their future abroad, moved by a value-based evaluation of their situation in their homelands. My own decision to defect from communist Poland in 1975, although simultaneously motivated by a projective vision of a free and accomplished life, had a distinct component of a value choice. In this case, my abhorrence of the Soviet communist, Soviet style communism and the Orwellian existence it created. My dissident colleagues who stayed on would not even consider leaving because of the same value rational choice operating a rebour, as it were. There was a fight, uh, a battle uh, to fight and escaping would be defeatist if not outright treacherous. An example of a tangible impact of a collective or shared value rational motivation on the actions of immigrants was the behavior of the early phase Zionist settlers in Palestine. Although coping with dire existential conditions and uncertain future, those settlers did everything they could in the name of the Zionist ideology and against the practical considerations, hunger and, and contagious diseases were rampant to bring over others. Related to migrants' individual and collective choices and pursuits, my second suggestion concerns the adjective social, which customarily accompanies the conceptualization of human actors. Look at the title of this session. What bothers me is not so much the term social itself, but possible presumptions behind it. <coughs> While recognizing the obvious social nature of who we are, that is the sociocultural genesis and contents of a large portion of our predilections, habits, and dreams for the future, uh, we should nevertheless, I believe, remain attentive to the existence of actors, potential and actual migrants in our case, whose thinking and activities uh, are less firmly anchored in the immediate social surroundings due to the location therein or idiosyncratic characteristics. Differently put, perhaps it would make sense to keep in mind two distinct dimensions of the social in our accounting of the role of human actors in the migration process. The diachronic or emergent over time through resocialization processes and the synchronic or happening here and now. Neither of the recent FEMIS papers which address the role of human actors in the migration process and come closest to opening up the notion of the social pursue these ideas. In the discussion of the role of pioneers uh, generating, uh, in generating the migration systems, Oliver Bakewell, uh, Heinde Haas and Agnieszka Kuba allow for asocial behavior among migrants whose agency is driven by the desire for innovation, but they do not elaborate on possible theoretical implications of this phenomenon. And neither do Agnieszka uh, Kubal and Rianne Decker in the essay on interwave dynamics of Ukrainian migration to the United Kingdom and the Netherlands, although they postulate to replace either or with how much to, to what extent questions about migration related phenomena would nicely accommodate making the social character of actors undertaking a matter of degree. In this uh, context, I would like to make another uh, suggestion regarding the source of the reconstitutive capacity of human agency. 
Two different interpretations of this issue exist among proponents of both the revised structuration and morphogenesis theories. Uh, one of them locates the source in our individual human vital energies, and the other views agency as a faculty emergence in the process of transaction or exchange among actors. Rather than arguing for the individual or interactive nature of human agency, this, this because at least in my field, primary field sociology, it just bores me to tears, this endless discussion, is it this or that, this either or. So rather that, I propose that we allow for uh, both, theoretically allow for both sources of actors' capacity to reconstitute the environment, and that we make the actual mechanisms of this process time and place dependent, contingent upon individual and group accustomed Weltanschauungen and social, sociocultural capital, the mode of operation of the economy and political system, and the degree of differentiation and individualization of society and its particular fragments. I have one further proposition regarding the refinement of Emil Byers and Misha's conceptualization of different dimensions of human agency. Uh, namely, an addition of the third di dimension of its evaluative component, the aesthetic one. It can be, it is true, subsumed under value judgment, but by keeping it separate as a potential motivator, we would gain, I believe, a more accurate insight into the mechanisms that make people stay put or move to another places. A non, not insignificant number of turn of the 20th century Polish Gurale migrants, inhabitants of the Tatra Mountains of, in the southeastern part of the country, are reported to have returned home from Chicago because of the brzydkie równe widoki, ugly flat landscape of the American habitat and an acute nostalgia for the hills of the homeland. In his study of young Britons in today's Paris, Stephen Scott illustrates the aesthetic reasons for those migrants' choice of the destination and then prolongation of their sojourn in the city. And Camila Kowalskas and Andrea Pelicia's research among post-EU access Polish migrants in Rome likewise reconstructs the original aesthetic motivations of those settlers to go to Italy. Oto bardzo piękny kraj, because it's a very beautiful country. And their subsequent economic motivations to move regretfully somewhere else when Italy was struck by the recession in 2008. Finally, still in terms of the general representation of human agency, I would like to reiterate two, whoops, two admonitions to myself as a comparative historical sociologist and well, to my colleagues in the field of international migration studies. One of them concerns the need for sustained attention as we try to identify patterns and create typologies in the material we examine. In this case, the preferences, motives, and pursuits of human actors to the common ambivalence and undecidedness among migrants. Although emphasized by scholars such as uh, Katie Gardner, who observed that international travelers tended to be, I quote, perpetually undecided in matters of where and how they want to live, unquote. This attribute of the actors has not been, in my opinion, sufficiently reflected in our efforts to theorize the migration process. Uh, at the ISA Congress in Yokohama in July 2014, Peter Kivisto and Paolo Bocani will have a session entitled Ambivalence as a Category for Migration Studies. So perhaps we'll move forward on this issue. Uh, related to it, the second reminder is to keep in mind as we conceptualize and empirically examine human agency, its inherently <coughs> processual nature, a state of continuous <coughs> becoming, as I said, rather than fixed being. An important step in this direction has been proposed by the earlier noted Kubal and Decker paper on interwave migration dynamics of Ukrainians to the UK and uh, in the UK and the Netherlands. The authors argue against the either or or yes or no approach to the role of pioneers in driving international migration and by extension I gather also to the analysis of other uh, aspects of migratory process and for the how much, to what extent and under what conditions questions <coughs> instead. 
this uh, approach not only recognizes the context dependent and thus changing situations involving migration, but also an important regarding my previous suggestions, allows the researcher to record and account for the often prolonged ambivalence and indecision among the migrating or migrating in SPA actors. And yet, despite the outspoken advocacy of the contingency approach to the study of migration, uh, in the conclusion of the paper, Kubal and Decker proclaimed the general tendencies regarding the bridgeheading and gatekeeping roles of the pioneers in channeling this process. My preference would be to formulate the conclusion of the analysis in the spirit which informed the author's recommendations regarding research questions. How much and to what extent, or in this case, making a softer assessment dependent on the place, duration, and specific trajectories of the examined events, uh, which would also better reflect the processual treatment of these phenomena. A good <coughs> illustration of the contingent, time-sensitive treatment of migrants' actors' priorities can be found, I don't know if you are familiar with it, in Lace and Kobayashi's 2005 examination of the decision-making process of uh, return migrants from Canada to Hong Kong. Now, am I moving closer and closer to the audience here? <laughs> now, <laughs> drawing on these propositions and the contributions made by the recent Themis papers, and especially the arguments of the authors about the multifactorial context-dependent nature of the role of migrants in facilitating or hindering the subsequent settlement of people in a particular place. In the reminder of my presentation, I offer some further suggestions about the role of actors in different phases of the migration process. As the pioneers of the flow, as contributors to the emergence of the migration <coughs> systems, and as agents in the continuation of transnational travels. Thus, in the conclusion of the otherwise elegantly nuanced discussion of the complexities of migrant actors pioneering or not subsequent flows, uh, Bakewell, De Haas, and Kubel seem to fix in time and situation the operation of the particular agentic components informing migrant pioneers' pursuits. I quote, the pioneers with a dominant innovative element of the agency will be more oriented toward cutting off the ties with the origin community, unquote, while those with a prevailing iterative orientations, iterative, by the way, is uh, Emir Bayern Misha's parlance for people who are not familiar with it, means habitual, habituated in the Bourdieu sense. So while those with a prevailing iterative orientations will be likely to, I quote again, serve as transnational community building agents assisting their fellow country folk in migration, I quote. I would uh, reiterate here my earlier suggestion to soften such general statements in recognition of the ever contingent circumstances of our lives. Dominant at the moment, uh, the innovative dimension of a migrant's agency may change in a year when she becomes pregnant or when her elderly mother in the home country becomes ill. Furthermore, as Michal Garapic has persuasively demonstrated in his research on present-day Polish migrants in London, many of the pioneers remain ambivalent, if not torn, <coughs> by contradictory feelings about their perceived obligations not only towards their emotionally distant fellow nationals, but also close friends and family members and troubled inner state that results in those people often erratic behavior regarding assistance to prospective migrants, shifting from active help to pretending that they are not there. Now, as for the role of actors in the emergence of migration systems, assuming the pioneer function does have this effect, Cindy Horst presents here cases when it doesn't, my improvement suggestions concern the need to pay closer attention to the conditions responsible for the varied pace of the emergence of different systems on the one hand, and on the other, the different survival capacity. As defined by Dave Elder Vass, emergence, I quote, is the idea that the whole can have properties or powers that are not possessed by its parts, 
or to put it more rigorously, properties that would not be possessed by its parts if they were not organized as a group into, into the form of this particular kind of a whole." Unquote. In my 2000, <coughs> 2011 the Themis paper, I tried to recon... 10 minutes? One minute. I'm running, you know, why do am I running? So... <coughs> I and I'll be, done, I'll be done in three. In my 2011 Themis paper, I tried to reconstruct processes of emergence at the turn of the 20th century of three translocal structures, which met Elder Vass's definition and the role in these developments of the actors, uh, Polish peasant migrants in America, namely uh, social networks of information about living and working conditions in American industrial cities, social control systems extending from immigrant communities to home country villages, and transatlantic migration cultures among income-seeking peasants. In a subsequent theoretical elaboration of these developments, I have an essay coming out next month. It's in press, if anybody's interested. This is in this bibliography here. So in my subsequent elaboration, I proposed three necessary, though probably not sufficient, conditions involving human actors uh, for the emergence of micro-level migration systems. First, a sufficient number of interrelated people pursuing specific activities. Second, the steadfastness, if you want, or regularity over time of the interrelatedness contingent on third, the endurance over time of the actors evaluative and projective interest with sufficient intensity and with resolvable tensions in between these concerns to enable them to pursue this activity in an organized or collective fashion. Interestingly, the emergence and attainment by the turn of the 20th century transatlantic social control systems of a causal power over the involved Polish immigrants took considerably longer, by a decade and a half if not two, than the establishment of the information systems. The varied pace of the emergence of different translocal structures revealed in the case of the turn of the 20th century Polish migration to America uh, suggests the need to refine the concept of emergence to first allow for and then account for such variants. I would begin this work with a recognition that, how shall I put it, the different quantities and levels of concentration of the same circumstances, here the conditions of the emergent structures, generate qualitatively different outcomes. As I was preparing this presentation, it occurred to me that, that perhaps the trajectory or sequence in which the events happen Met, may matter here as well, and I, I will not elaborate on it here, but be happy to, to respond to it in the discussion. Now, <clears throat> migration scholars have examined launching of migration systems, but the varied survival capacity has thus far received little attention. This differential ability is revealed by the examination of the orientations and activities of Polish immigrants in America, and they fellow nationals in Poland in the decades following the peak of mass transatlantic migrations. The outbreak of World War I in Europe in 1914 and in its wake the implementation of immigration restrictions in the United States that uh, effectively ended its op long-standing open-door policy, first uh, completely halted and then cut back to a trickle, the swelling flow of Polish and other labor migrants. The Great Depression on both sides of the Atlantic further diminished these travels. With the loosening of the conditions that had sustained translocal information and social control systems established at the beginning of the century, which supported Polish peasants' transatlantic migratory flows, uh, these structures uh, began to dissolve gradually. But the local cultures of migration formed in several regions of Poland have not survived long after the, the sustaining conditions have practically disappeared, uh, suggesting that, I go slowly here that I say what I want to say, suggesting that both the contents or in terms of Elder Vass's conceptualization, morphostatic components 
and sustaining features of the structures may transform in different contexts. In the case examined here, the culture of migration reflected in its carrier's mental readiness to go, combined with a can-do inner posture, common, common among many Polish families in the post-World War II period, had acquired a new function of symbolic resistance to the status quo, here the Soviet regime, that took over its previous role as a resource applied in actual migratory travels, pursuits. The survival of the cultures of migration has been maintained by the collective memories of transatlantic travels undertaken in the past, regularly expressed and exchanged in private encounters in Poland. I participated in it. The constellation of circumstances responsible for different survival capacities of migration systems, both the agentic and structural parts, clearly need further <coughs> attention from migration <coughs> scholars. My final comment concerns the process of sustained migration. Existing accounts of the factors contributing to the persistence of migratory flows have primarily focused on the movement of people from place A to place B, and also on the back and forth or shuttle travels between these two locations. I would like to call our attention to the increasingly common phenomenon, especially among young people, of the continuously redirected travels, the ongoing movement whose actors respond to up to the minute a labor market or political conditions in different regions involving several countries. Ah, now that, but it's much better. And particularly among migrants from more developed countries and better of families, which even if they cannot support them financially, do not need those travelers' continuous contributions to their livelihoods. The movement which reflects those migrants searching and researching themselves in the world for self-fulfillment, a variety of experience including education and earnings and exciting adventure. Anita, a young Polish woman who has since 2009 lived for a bit in Ireland, Spain in her hometown in Poland and then Italy, then again in Ireland, and for whom as she put it, I quote, Migration has become a way of life, a series of temporary stops in an ongoing travel, unquote. It's a good example of this never-ending all-around movement. In the Themis uh, paper, Marcia van Meteren and Sofia Pereira identify the travels of such people whom they call seekers of the experience of life, experience, and culture as an ascending type of present-day migrations, but they do not consider the implications of this phenomenon for the migration theory. Of concern here, such vagabonds agency seems to be mobilized by the ever-turning kaleidoscope of projective, practical, value-oriented, uh, aesthetic, and iterative um, concerns, which form fleeting constellations, a situation of permanent flux, which makes it impossible to assess even softly, as I postulated, the prevailing composition. It is also an open-ended, migration process. One wonders whether the temporality of life events or the dimensions of time, such as space, rhythm, and sequence, which the historical sociologists have taken for granted as the important causal variables in the analysis of humans in society, matters at all, and if so, how, in channeling the pursuits of these nomads. And if these wander wanderers create, or better, participate in any migration systems, is it primarily the global virtual information service in the continuous recomposition, as described in the Themis paper by Rianne Decker and Gottfried Engbersen? Although this type of movement involves a minority of the migrating population worldwide, those whose international travels are facilitated by the accommodating structures, political, passport and visa, regulations and economic <coughs> possible available means to survive and even save a little money. Our conceptualization of the migration process and its constitutive components should be able to account for this phenomenon. Thank you. <coughs>